uh, on workshop introduction on high performance computing on center for development of advanced computing by ashish kuvelkar garu ashish kuvelkar garu obtained his master's degree in electrical engineering from vjti bombay university at cdac that is center for development of advanced computing he has been involved in development of hardware subsystems for various generation of param super computing systems and sharing knowledge with students of post graduate diploma courses conducted by advanced computing training school of center for development of advanced computing currently in his role as a convener of expert group on human resources development of the national super computing mission he is involved in leading the activities of the expert group and implementing its mandate of building hpc aware manpower by working with the stakeholders from educational and research institutes in india and abroad and with the industry sir i request you to please come on to the dais am i audible okay good afternoon so uh, i am going to talk to you about uh, what is high performance computing is and this uh, particular uh, symposium is up on data driven deep disruption and uh, in the i attended just the session before this little bit of it and uh, that talked about how they collect the data the video data and how they interpret it and how they help in helping the uh, driver so many of these ai systems uh, or or the technologies that you would have heard about uh, they need some computing systems uh, on which uh, uh, you you run those algorithms and high performance computing is one such kind of hardware or one kind such kind of system that can also be used for ai related applications i think they are feeling hot so in the morning they were feeling very cold now they are feeling hot maybe you can turn the ac on for some time and uh, then that can be switched off later <coughs> okay so uh, let me uh, start with some applications of uh, uh, how high performance computing is used so that uh, you will be able to appreciate that ai and other things that you possibly see that's happening that driver uses it or something but many a times high performance computing systems uh, they are working silently and let me just give you some examples to begin with okay so we will go back little bit in time and uh, sometime in beginning of uh, uh, 2020 we got this news about uh, corona virus and in december there was some murmurs and uh, some time later this was uh, sort of the outbreak was a uh, sort of announced in the world fast forward one month then it got to know that it was really uh, a sort of a uh, pandemic that was spreading and few months down the line in the december of 2020 uh, we got to know that uh, the first vaccine has been approved okay and uh, if you look at the other vaccines i mean i'm uh, maybe in case you have done some study uh, you would know that uh, typically vaccines take years to be uh, you know offered to uh, like polio vaccine it took decades for it to be uh, actually made available similarly all the vaccines that you see in the history you will find that they took years for them to be made available to the patients then what was the magic that happened that uh, within a year we got this vaccine okay so there are some things that we need to see how this was possible okay so before that let's understand uh, what that virus was so you must have seen this picture many a times and uh, this is how the visualization of that virus has been done so that uh, technically or uh, you can say uh, medically 
that virus is called as SARS-CoV-2. So that is the one that was causing the coronavirus. And how does it spread or how does it affect human body? So the scientists have found that uh, it, when it affects human cell, it enters the human cell uh, through what is called as a lock and key effect, as the scientists call it. So what is that? So you, in the, in the picture that you see, you have uh, some kind of spikes uh, that uh, you see on those, uh, on that virus. So this spike, which you see the red color ones, they act as a key to unlock what is called as a ACE2 protein, which is on the human cell. Okay, so they, it comes and uh, then locks onto the human cell and then there is another virus, again these are all, I have learnt it from our team uh, who uh, deal with bioinformatics, that uh, there is another protein inside the cell which the scientists called as TMPRSS2, uh, which is a protease and uh, using that it enters the human cell and once it has entered the human cell, then the virus can reproduce, replicate and transmit itself. So this uh, cycle is continued and that's how one gets affected by corona. Now, how did we come to know this? We come to know this because what is called as wet lab. So when I mentioned traditionally uh, the vaccines took a few years because it was purely done through what is called as wet lab. So experiments, the pharmacists, the scientists, the medical fraternity, they would do these experiments in the lab and they would come out with uh, how uh, the behavior of a particular virus is, then they would find out how to take care of this virus. So now, what is the difference that has happened now? Wet labs are there, but there are simulations that were done on the HPC centers. And when this virus was stuck, uh, I would say that 90% of the HPC facilities in the world by all the countries including India and CDAC were committed for doing the research on how that virus is and how to find a solution to it. So HPC played a big role and that is how we could get the uh, vaccine in a very record time. Now let us see how they found out the vaccine. What is that they try to do? So here in this picture we see that uh, there is a main protease of that SARS-CoV-2 virus and there is a sm small thing here uh, that you see as uh, which gets ties. this is a kind of a molecule which is trying to dock with that virus and that is one of the basis for how to find out the drug interaction at the molecular level. And once that interaction takes place, we get to know whether that particular molecule of the drug, can it neutralize the virus that for which we are trying to find out a cure for, okay? So when you have such kind of docking, what they try to do is there is a two-step process, so which is true for finding out a, 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 a finding out a drug for any disease that you are looking at, is that you uh, look at the prediction of the molecule structure that you are trying to use as a medicine and then you try to see whether that molecule can bind with that virus and if it can bind then it can possibly neutralize it. So one has to go through this process for various types of alignments, various types of molecules, all of this has to be done and there are various orientations, so it's a basically an iterative process. You tried all the possibilities, which earlier were being done in wet lab. Today, this is being done, which is very, very computationally expensive when we make expensive it means in terms of time. And you can do a lot of these things in parallelly, like you try one orientation, then you try another orientation. All these runs of trying to see this simulation, they can be done in in a, using a parallel computer. And this is the reason why we could use the high performance computing facilities to our advantage to get the vaccine. And there were various, various attempts, you might have heard about it, Pfizer did it, there are so many other companies that did it, India had 
its own share in doing that we tried in cdac we also tried to look at the <coughs> molecules of ayurveda whether they can be neutralized and ashwagandha and so many other uh, uh, traditional medicine was tried so all this was possible because we had high performance computing facilities with us okay so this when hpc was used this highly compute intensive task could be speeded up greatly because we had these computing systems with us not only in india but all in all the countries around the world okay so that i thought could give you an idea what is the significance of hpc because many a times we do not know that uh, there are things that are done using high performance computing i will give you a list of them and uh, <coughs> that's that i thought could be one way of uh, convincing you that uh, there are there are many things that are done uh, using the high performance computing so i will begin with an introduction little bit of history then we look at the basics then we'll see what are the components in a supercomputer then we will see how we make use of hpc i'll give you brief idea about uh, the national supercomputing mission that is being currently executed in the country and uh, i thought there were some startups and all here so because of that i included few more slides about some of the systems that cdac makes so maybe you could also be interested in that okay so uh, the first computer that was uh, ever made and it actually functioned and it was put to use was sometime when uh, india got independence in the year 1947 but this was in us so this was being made uh, for uh, us military and uh, they were it was used for calculating the trajectories of uh, missiles that were being fired in world war 2 so if you uh, start use that as a starting point and you see that it is such a big system but has a modest compute power it takes lot of uh, electrical power but it generates very modest compute power so if you keep going ahead you will find that there are two uh, lines that are drawn here the green one this green one is one which shows that it is an operations it can do per second ops is operations per second so this essentially refers to integer operations that it can do in a second and the earlier systems they could do only integer operations and i'm sure you would have studied that uh, there are integer operations and there are floating point operations so in floating point operation you have a mantis and exponent and when you use floating point operations uh, you get better accuracy and the computing systems beyond you can see here 1960 onwards we started measuring what is called as flops so f stands for floating point so not just integer but floating point operations uh, were being done by the computers and now whatever good computing that you see that is the one which i shall explain you now in the subsequent slides they are all being done using floating point operations so if you want to do want to have good accuracy and you if you want to have results that uh, that are in sync with reality then you need to do what is called as floating point operations and supercomputers are good at doing large amount of floating point operations in a second so we talked about we talked about science that was traditionally done using wet lab so how do we do that so science is basically you first start with a theory saying that you see some phenomena in the nature you say that this happening because of this is the theory that i propose or you want to discover something or you have invent something you will put a theory like how stars were born or there are many examples you can give where you start with a theory then that theory leads to experiments like you have to prove that that okay i am saying that uh, okay uh, when you uh, when an object is given a free fall it goes at an acceleration at 9.8 meters per second square when you say that you have to do an experiment prove and then say that there exists something called as gravity and when you can do it repeatedly that is you propose a theory and it can be done th proved through repeated experiments not just a flash in the pan then we say that it is a science and when you are doing science this statement from uh, galileo uh, is very important and that is that is also the basis of supercomputers that uh, he said in the uh, 15th century that mathematics is the alphabet 
like we have A, B, C, D, thus 26 letters that form the alphabet. Similarly, he said that mathematics the, is the alphabet with which God has written the universe, which means any, any phenomena that you see in the universe that's happening, not just earth, anywhere, you will be able to have a theory that can be based on the mathematics. So whether you do physics, chemistry, biology, any of these sciences, astronomy, astrophysics, mathematics is the basis of it. And that is what is exploited by computers and specifically supercomputers. So the modern way, what helped us, how you do science today, you always have the theory, you always have the experiments to prove it, but now it is supplemented by computations. So that's the point I was trying to make when I gave you the first example saying how the cure or the vaccine for uh, corona was found out in a such a record time. That's because the computation today plays a great role when we do science. And that's where we get this word called as computational science. That is you have science which is based on mathematics you have computer science. I'm sure many of you are students of computer science where you study algorithms and other things, how to apply that. And when you put all these things together, you get what is called as computational science. And that is a basis of usage of supercomputers. So I will give you some examples where the supercomputers are being used. <coughs> they are used in science. They are used in engineering. Let's begin with uh, some examples from the scientific background. So one of them, the one of the earliest applications worldwide of supercomputers was atmospheric science. And incidentally, uh, CDAC was born in 1988 when India wanted a supercomputer for weather prediction. And at that time, uh, the only company that used to make was an American company called Cray. And India wanted that supercomputer and it was denied to us. Because as we shall see, there are many uses of supercomputer. So at that time, uh, those in power in US, they felt that India might take it for saying that it, they need it for weather forecasting, but they can use it for design of missiles, for nuclear reactors, and it's a dual edge technology. So it was denied to us, and that's how uh, C India decided to build its own supercomputer, and that's how CDAC was uh, born in 1988 for making supercomputers for the primary application of atmospheric science. So what do we do with this? First is weather forecasting. So every day evening when you see uh, in the news what's the weather going to be for tomorrow or there are many sites that tell how what the weather is going to be in a particular region, then it's being the, the there is a program called WRF and that program is run on supercomputer. It's a model of weather. And still, uh, I mean, the scientists are still uh, trying to uh, improve the model. They are trying to make it sure that the model is being, uh, uh, being updated to ha make the weather prediction as, as good as possible. So weather forecasting is one of the major applications of uh, uh, HPC. Then climate change, that's the new thing. You might have heard about COP27, the conference that was held few weeks or maybe just last week, wherein the world is grappling with uh, climate change because of the emissions that are happening and the ozone layer being uh, depleted and because of which uh, unprecedented flood, extreme weather conditions, these are happening. So uh, trying to model it, trying to predict how that change is going to be and trying to save the earth from happening that by taking appropriate actions is what the supercomputers are used for predicting the climate change. Another important task uh, that never existed maybe 50 years ago is air quality. Today we are all concerned about the quality of air that we breathe, especially in uh, uh, urban areas this problem is even worse. Many of you would be aware that in this season the fog in Delhi becomes really bad because of various reasons, uh, one of them being uh, that the farmers, uh, they burn their, uh, the remnants of the, uh, of the crop they have taken. So there are many such uh, reasons, vehicular pro pollution, and there are many such uh, things which result in air quality deteriorating. 
So correctly predicting or modeling it and predicting and controlling it is one of the applications of uh, HPC. Earth science, that's another uh, important um, uh, science that uh, uses HPC, which uh, deals with understanding the physical properties of structures like water bodies, uh, then mountains, and things that are below the surface of Earth. All that is taken care or all that comes under the purview of Earth science. And seismic exploration, exploration deals with, uh, 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 as the word suggests, it deals with uh, earthquakes. But as we all know, it's not, it's not possible to predict. Nobody can predict uh, earthquakes. They happen uh, because of some of the uh, movements that happen below the crust of Earth. We may get some signals, but uh, it's not still the science has not developed so much so as to say that a earthquake is going to occur at particular location uh, with this intensity on the Richter scale. That we have still have to go far away for that. But seismic exploration also deals with sending artificial waves down the crust of Earth, then reading those waves that are reflected. And based on that, one can figure out whether there is oil and gas below the surface of Earth. So that is one of the use of high performance computing by understanding the uh, the properties of uh, Earth and what is below the crust of Earth. Uh, now let's take a few examples from uh, engineering. So one of the very important uses of HPC is in simulation of crash of cars. Some of you may be aware that there is an agency called NCAP which gives the star ratings to the safety of a car. Like if an in an unfortunate uh, incident, a car is involved in an accident, whether the occupants of the car will be saved. Like many of you would know that you have the uh, airbags that prevent uh, the death of a driver or the people sitting inside the car. Similarly, how good the structure of the car is, that the, will the car absorb the shock or will it pass it on to the occupants? If you want to know that, then this testing the safety of a design. What was the traditional way you build a car and there are agencies like uh, Automotive Research Association of India and there are many couple of other agencies that actually crash the car, they put uh, dummy loads inside, put sensors on them, see how much forces are uh, they subjected to, whether their head will go and hit some part, how, what stresses will their body feel, all that is tested for checking the safety of automobile design. So earlier it used to, you would crash 20, 30 cars and then make changes and finally arrive at a design that is safe. Today, all that can be done using the simulation. So you make, prove your design on the computer that it is good, then you may crash one or two cars just to see that the design is correct. So this helps in reducing the cycle that it takes to produce a safe car and it also reduces the money that is involved in crashing so many cars. Then another area which some of you might have heard is called as CFD or computational fluid dynamics. So this is useful for designing any part, any solid part that moves to a fluid. So it could be missile that is moving through an air, a rocket that is being launched to outside Earth's atmosphere. It could be a ship that is moving through water or a submarine that is moving through water. So all these techniques, like the right design, what kind of design will result in least amount of forces that the moving object is subjected to. So this kind of simulations can be done and the design can be then validated in wind tunnels and other objects to arrive at a most efficient design. Similarly, in civil engineering, uh, it is used for doing structural analysis. So uh, like you design a bridge, like it's seen in the picture, or you design a dam. All these civil structures, they are subjected to forces, like wind forces, uh, earthquake forces, if it's a bridge, then there is a loading of vehicles on it. If it's a railway bridge, then there is a locomotive which is uh, subjecting it to stresses. 
So this can be this kind of analysis of the design can be done using a method called as finite element analysis. This is again a very compute intensive task and this is used, these methods are used using supercomputers. One can uh, design these structures and know the weaknesses or take appropriate action to make the design better. Then this all of you might have seen this, this kind of movies, avatars or uh, movies that have characters that are not real, but they look so real. That is again done, what is done is you form a, a sort of a structure of, a, of that uh, you can say humanoid or that animal or whatever it is and then you put a, 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 a surface on top of that and then you sh can show expressions, you can show emotions. So if you have to do that, that's a very, very compute intensive task. And all these animation tools, like you say that initial in one frame, the hand of the person is here and 10 frames later the hand moves here. So this rendering of all of this, this can be done using scientific processing algorithms. And all the major companies in the world that produce this like Pixar, DreamWorks, they all use what is called as graphics processing unit and that is all they use high performance computing. So these are some of the examples where high performance computing use. Maybe you may be aware of some of them, maybe you are not aware of many of them. So this could be an eye opener for you that HPC is not something very costly and uh, something that is not accessible to anybody, but it is being used widely by researchers, by scientists, and even uh, in many of the educational institutes, I shall tell you later, they have supercomputers with them today. So we will begin with what is the basic idea behind this? How does all this work? Okay. So the basic principle uh, that uh, drives the HPC is that you have large problems and these large problems can be divided into smaller ones. Okay. That is, uh, you, if you have a big problem, first step is to break it into small problem. And most importantly, they can be solved concurrently. Okay. Normally when you write a C program, you write a algorithm and that algorithm runs, maybe there are loops, there are decisions and finally, your algorithm is implemented. Maybe you start with the flow chart, convert that flow chart into a, 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 a sort of sequence of instructions that you write into a program. So this is what is called as a serial program. And one after other, the instructions are executed by the computer. However, if the program is large, if the problem is large, the program data is large, and you write a serial program, it will run, but it may take a lot of time. Sometimes the data set is so large that it is unable to fit into the memory of the computer. If that is the case, then what you need to do is you look at the algorithm, break that problem into smaller ones, and these smaller programs should be running, these smaller tasks should be running concurrently. So parallelism is an inherent characteristics of supercomputers. Otherwise, if you run them serially, there is no charm in it because it is going to take a lot of time. Hence, you have a parallel processing by which you make use of hardware that has got multiple processing elements. This is very important that you should have multiple processing elements at your disposal. Then you have a program, you write it in such a way that it can take advantage of these multiple processing element. Okay. One example of this is, I am sure each one of you is carrying in your pocket, that is your smartphone. Now these smartphones earlier had one small CPU, but today all of them are either quad core, octa core, or many of them are like 16 core. So any program that you are, the operating system or the program that you are running has to make use of these multiple cores. So what is that? That is nothing but multiple processing element. So what was a supercomputing technology decades ago that has now become 
a computing technology that is now in pocket of every citizen. Another example of this is also called as distributed computing. Like uh, you in your computer lab, you may be having something like 30 or 50 computers. They are all connected with Ethernet LAN. Technically, it is possible to use this as a parallel processing platform. So you use the network to transmit data and you have a mechanism by which all these computers will act together to solve a big problem. The concept is same, that you need multiple processing element. They could be in form of cores uh, or they could be form of certain CPUs in a, on a motherboard or they could be spread across a lab. But the concept is same, that you have multiple computing elements and you assign small, small tasks to each of these computing elements. All right, so taking this forward, then what is high performance computing? So high performance computing makes use of this basic principle of parallel processing. And don't think that I have one program that runs slow on a computer. I will take that program and run it on a supercomputer and it will start running fast. No, it is not like that. You have to design a program that will be targeted towards a supercomputer or using parallel computing. Okay. So advanced application programs, meaning you have a big task to solve, only then you make use of a supercomputer. It is not that your serial program will automatically run fast because it's a supercomputer. No, that can happen if your program is running on a 1 gigahertz processor and you run it on a 3 gigahertz processor, the, pro the, the program may run faster but not any program that you take will run 10 times or 100 times faster just by taking into supercomputer. No, you use it when you have numeric simulations, you have modeling or large amount of data to be processed. So if you have a big problem to solve, then only you should approach a supercomputer and it should be such that it requires a lot of mathematical calculations. That is very important. If you have a program, if you have a problem to solve that involves lot of mathematical calculations, then you will be the supercomputer or high performance computing is the right platform for you. Okay? And you have to design these applications from ground up and there are few applications I told you, weather forecasting, computational fluid dynamics, finite element methods, partial differential equations. So if you have to do that, uh, that kind of calculations, then you can use supercomputers. They are then the right platform for use. And what is the definition of a supercomputer? We will say that the fastest supercomputer today that exists, a set of fastest supercomputers, they will be called as the supercomputers, the fastest set of computers. Another example I will give you. The first supercomputer that CDAC designed in 1988 had less power, less compute power than the mobile phones of today. So what are we trying to uh, explain here? We are trying to say that what were supercomputers of yesterday, they no longer remain the supercomputers of today or tomorrow because better and better computers are coming every day and the top of those are called as supercomputers. So I kept mentioning uh, floating point operations and that is the metric that we use to measure the power of a supercomputer. Okay? So this is actually, uh, it stands for floating point operations per second. Okay? And then depending upon how many uh, operations are being done, like if you have 10 to the power 6 operations per second, we will call it as a mega flop. Okay? 10 to the power 9, giga flop. 10 to the power 12, teraflop, petaflop. Today, the fastest supercomputer is slightly above one exaflop. And the supercomputers that are going to term later, they are, the terms are already set for them, zeta flops and yota flops. Okay? And which are the top supercomputers in the world? There is a website called top500.org. So this particular website, it has the least of top supercomputers in the world. 
Now you will ask, how does it find out which are those super top supercomputers in the world? The way they do it is, uh, they run a program called as a benchmark. So what is a benchmark? It's a program. Suppose you want to select a computer for, let's say, running AutoCAD. You want to set up a lab and you want a best computer for it. What is the way you will find out which is the best one? What is the right amount of memory? How much CPU speed it should have? There are some computers available in the market. You will take a program, run it there, and see how much time does it take. Let's say you have a 3D model. How fast does it render? That what is What are you doing? You are essentially benchmarking, trying to use the same yardstick to measure the performance of various computers. So that is called as benchmark. And uh, the benchmark that is used for rating the supercomputers is called as high performance LINPACK. So that's a program. So CDAC sets up a supercomputer, Param Siddhi AI. They will run this HPL benchmark. It will give a result saying that your supercomputer's power is five petaflop. It will say that if you run the program for couple of days and it will give you a result. That result you submit to the top 500 website and they will take such submissions and come out with a list. Okay, so here is a graph that shows from the year 1990s uh, till 2023 or 2022 how the power of supercomputers increased. Like here on this x-axis you have the years and on the y-axis you have the performance. So what is this performance? This is according to this table. How much teraflop, how much petaflop and today if you see this I think I'll okay, so this this particular graph it shows what is the power of number one? And the blue one shows what is the power of the 500. So like this, the graph, if you see it keep increasing, and the one, the top one today, what you see here, is just above one exaflop. And where is it? It is installed at a la laboratory called Oak Ridge Laboratory, which is uh, under Department of Electronics in US. And this is the first supercomputer to have crossed the one exaflop boundary. Another inference we can draw is, let's say this, this computer in the year 1995, it had a rating of 100 gigaflops. If you draw a horizontal line, this has become 500. When? In the year somewhere around 2004. So what is the conclusion that within certain period, the top supercomputer, let's say six years or seven years, the top supercomputer does not remain in the list. It gets a performance which is less than the rank 500. So that is one that one can see from here that the supercomputers, they become outdated very fast. For that matter, over any computer you buy today, a laptop that you buy today, you may not be using it after three or four years because you would have got better and better computers that applies to supercomputers as well. Okay? So now let us try and understand how do you build a supercomputing system. Okay? So let's take an example. Earlier, the supercomputing systems that were built were like a, let's say here is an example of earth moving machine. So you want to move more amount of earth in an hour, you will make a big wheel, bigger wheel. Then you will have a bigger diesel engine you will have the entire thing bigger and then it will be able to uh, move more amount of earth. So that is how faster and faster supercomputers were built in the 1980s and 90s that I mentioned to you, Cray supercomputers, they were built like that. Okay? But subsequently what happened was people tried to use another method. Now take the same example that you want to move the earth. What do you do? You divide the field into nine parts and take these JCB machines which are very easily available, cheaper and then you can have the same effect. Suppose you want to have, you can put 20 such machines, your area will get doubled. So it is a scalable technique and this is called as a cluster. So what is a cluster? Cluster is the same example that I gave you that in your lab you have 20 computers, you connect them using 
uh, you connect them using a network and that is called as a cluster. So here we see this, the Cray supercomputer that was custom built and that was equivalent to the big machine that we had. Okay, whereas the supercomputers that CDAC is building, the supercomputers that are being built today that uses this same methodology that you have off-the-shelf components, machines which are cheaper, but you deploy a lot of them. So maybe this picture is you are not able to see, but each of these is a, is a computer. So there are nine computers in one rack, and there are so many racks. So you have 288 computers that are connected together, and that is how you have Param UR2. So this is one of the supercomputers at CDAC Pune. So what is inside this? Try, let's try and understand that. So by now, I'm sure you would have got to understand that uh, by putting many computing elements together, collectively we try to get more compute power. So it is not just that you put them together and it will behave like a big supercomputer, but you have to have some mechanism to bind them together. So the compute nodes is the one that forms the workhorse. So you have each compute node has certain number of processors. Together they have something like thousands of processors or cores and they work together. So now how do they work together? For that, like you have Ethernet, similarly you have InfiniBand, ParamNet, these are some high speed networks and you use a interconnect or a high speed low latency network to connect all of them together. So this will form the heart of the supercomputer that you have a certain number of processing elements and they are connected together. Now, in, like in any computer, you have the CPU, memory, and I.O. So hard disk is an I.O. device. So you need that here. And the uniqueness about this system is that it is not a simple file system like Unix file system but it is a parallel file system, okay? So parallel, what is the use of a parallel file system? It allows, see, typically let's say you are running a process on a computer, you open a file for read-write. It will not allow another processor to write to it. It may allow it to read, but it may not allow it to write because it, the file is being locked for write by one process. But this particular parallel file system, it allows multiple compute elements to read and write from the same file, but the programmer has to make sure that two computers, they are operating on the different data within that file. Otherwise, if two try to write on the same area, then there could be a problem, but that is to be taken care by the programmer. So you have this basic element, compute nodes, a method to connect them, that is a switching fabric, and a parallel file system where data and program are stored, okay? Now many of this data that is frequently needed is put in a set of nodes like I'm sure you would have heard about SSDs, okay? So SSDs are, are not magnetic medium but they are solid state drive like your pen drive or your flash drive. So that uses flash memories and flash memories can read write faster than hard disks. So frequently needed code and data is stored in a set of nodes which have got SSDs. Similarly, you would have heard about GPGPUs, NVIDIA GPUs. If you are owning a gaming laptop, it has a GPU, that is a graphics processing unit. So that is also used for high performance computing. So you have these compute nodes that have got NVIDIA accelerators or AMD accelerators or Intel accelerators. So what they do, do is certain algorithms, certain programs can be run much faster on this, okay? Then like any file system has got a backup, tape backup, you want to put data or something that can be put here and uh, you want to exchange data with somebody, put them on the tape drives and you can send it across. Now this is the basic thing, these are the basic elements that form a supercomputer. But now you have, you would have noticed that these nodes are simply headless, meaning they don't have a mouse, keyboard, monitor. 
how do you take care how do you debug if there is a problem how do you make sure that all of it is working fine so for that you have what is called as a management node which i'm uh, you can see that black colored line so there is are two networks one the red color line which is a primary network for exchange in data and a dedicated network which is like a gigabit ethernet network by which the system administrators they use this management node to collect information whether the compute nodes are working fine if they are facing any problem all that can be seen from the management node similarly when a user wants to run a program on this compute nodes you have a dedicated set of nodes called as login nodes and on this login nodes the user logs in and then he fires a job on the compute nodes so you have uh, internal users are in the local network there is a gateway through which they reach the login node so like i'm sure many of you would have used unix unix wherein you say login giving a username and a password and you then get a prompt so in a supercomputer the prompt that you will get would be would be on this login nodes and that is this looks pretty complex and that's why you need a dedicated set of system administrators who are on the management nodes and trying to uh, manage the whole supercomputing system now that is the hardware part it has to be complemented by the software okay so here you see the operating system so there are three parts the operating system the middleware and the programming tools and using this you run applications on your supercomputer so the operating system is a variant of linux cdac uses centos there are fedora ubuntu these are the other distributions but uh, uh, centos is one of the uh, popular ones that is used for supercomputers then you have some cluster monitoring tools these are used to know whether the cluster is which nodes in the cluster are up which one are busy which one are free so that is done through cluster monitoring tools you have a set of tools uh, i mentioned to you that on the login nodes you fire a job when you fire a job you say that i want so many nodes 10 nodes 16 nodes 32 nodes who allots the nodes the provisioning software so what does it do it keeps a track of which jobs are in the queue which one is next to run how many node does it want whether they are free or not all that is done by the provisioning tools then you have a file system which is as i mentioned to you uh, there is a parallel file system that is the luster file system and then you go one level above you have the programming tools so typically you use for uh, in your day to day work you use c compiler then a loader and a linker first a linker to link the libraries then a loader and you get a boot you get an image that can be run so here you have the application libraries uh, which help you they like doing the mathematics of it so parallel file uh, parallel operations of the libraries is required to be done so that is offered by this and of course you have the development tools which includes the compiler parallel compiler you have the performance monitoring tools which tell you what are the hot spots in your program how it can be improved so using all of this a programmer will write a parallel program and then he will run it on a parallel computing system okay so to recap the component of the supercomputer first you need processors a large amount of them then each processor should have good amount of memory because the code and data is going to be stored in that memory then we also said that if this large number of processors have to work together then you need a system by which uh, you can interconnect all of these systems okay so you need a system area network then we also said that for accelerating like gpu like uh, uh, like uh, platforms they are called as accelerator or coprocessors which aid the main processor in running the code faster and of course we mentioned that this data and code has to come from the storage which has got its own set of hard disk the accelerator ssds and a parallel file system then we also saw that stack which at the bottom most layer has the operating system and the compilers then you have i will explain little bit about mpi later that's a message passing interface and you need mechanisms to see that your perform their your computing program performs at its optimal level and using this you develop an application software 
which like your same as C program, but it is a parallel program that runs on multiple processors. Okay. So what are the features that each of these component has? Uh, processors have got high f higher frequency that the best processors available today will be used in making the supercomputers. As I mentioned earlier, floating point unit, uh, floating point operations is a key for that. So more number of floating point units is what is needed. Then more the, more the number of cores per chip, like I mentioned quad core, octa core, the Xeon processors, they have got 16 cores, uh, some of the AMD processors, they have got 64 cores. So these are the, uh, these help in having more processing unit at your disposal. Cache memory, some of you might have heard about this. It's a fast memory that sits between the main memory and the CPU. So that is called as a cache memory. So more the cache, more data can be fitting in a faster memory. Uh, have you studied Flyens classification of computers? Some of you would have studied, those who are from computer science background, in third year they would have studied it, Flyens classification. In that, there is something called as single instruction multiple data. That's a kind of architecture of the CPU. So that is called as, in technical terms, it's called as vector processing capability. They help in running the program faster. Here is an example. Intel has got a processor called Sandy Bridge that uh, Xeon Sandy Bridge that runs at 3 gigahertz, it has got 8 core, uh, 20 megabytes cache, it can do 8 floating point operation in one clock cycle, that is 3 into 10 to the power 9 times in a second, it can do 8 floating point operations, so, so many of them. So, and you have many such processors in your supercomputer. Memory. So you must have heard about SD RAMs that, that are the modules are there in your uh, desktop. Similar thing we need, but with higher bandwidth, that is the amount of memory that uh, data that can be transferred from the memory to the CPU should be very fast so that the CPU can run faster. They also have error correction capability so that on the fly, if there are errors in the memory, they can be corrected, okay? Interconnect, uh, so these are the network similar to your ethernet that allow uh, the computers to talk to each other. So their property is that the data should move very fast, low latency, and at the time, same time large chunks of data should be able to go. And then the network has got number of ports, so it should be able to support large number of nodes. The storage part, it has got a parallel file system and uh, as I already mentioned to you, its job is to transfer data very fast to the multiple CPUs, so its bandwidth is what matters. Accelerator, Intel came out with a, a technology called uh, many integrated cores. NVIDIA GPUs, uh, some of you may be aware, heard about them. The latest one is called as Ampere 100. AMD has a range called as Instinct. So. Among them, uh, I'll just explain a little bit about the NVIDIA GPU. So this is, you have to port the code. The code that is running on the CPU, that needs to be ported onto the GPUs. So a large number of such codes are available. Within one GPU, one chip, chip there are 7,000 CUDA codes. So these are lightweight cores, and they give, they can connect to 80 GB of uh, high bandwidth memory. And the whole purpose of using supercomputer is it should be able to crunch large amount of data in a short time. So that is what these CPUs are, GPUs are capable of. So now I will also explain uh, how uh, internal to the CPU, what are, how parallelism is achieved. So here is an example which shows only two cores of a CPU, but as I said, you get four core, eight core, 16 core, so same thing will be applicable there as well. So each CPU you see here, it has got its private memory that is called as L1 cache. And both of them share what is called as a L2 cache, that is a level two cache. So level one cache is closest to the CPU, it is private to the core. And then we have a memory, L2 memory, which is common to both of them. And they in turn connect. So the front side bus connects to the main memory. So this is how a each CPU looks like. 
Now these CPUs go on a motherboard. Now here is a motherboard that contains two sockets. Each one of them will contain one CPU. And in the example that I gave, each one of them will have two cores. And on a motherboard, there will be four cores. Suppose you have a CPU with 16 core, the motherboard will have 32 cores. And all of them have got own cache memories and the blue things that you see here, they will contain the SD RAM slots and the network interface card, the InfiniBand will go in this PCI Express slot. So that is one node. So one node has its own memory, it has got its own interconnect, all of this, and they will go into a box like this. And in this box, there will be one motherboard which will have, let's say, total of 16 cores or 32 cores or 64 cores, depending upon how many CPU and how many cores they have. Many such boxes will go into this rack. So maybe nine boxes or 18 boxes like this will go into a rack. They will be all connected using a network and thus you will get a supercomputer. So that is how you build, these are the components that are needed to build a supercomputer. Now, why do we use, why do we use this parallel computing? Why do we use the supercomputer? The reason is that you have a single CPU system, you have the desktops, but they have certain limitations. What are the limitations? One limitation is they are slow. You can run a weather production code on a desktop, but it will give you the result for tomorrow, two days later, because it's taking a lot of time, and you want the result today. So what are you going to do? You are going to take more CPUs. So that is what we do in a parallel computing. Another problem that uh, small systems face is that their memory is small. Each CPU can address certain amount of memory depending upon the address lines the CPU has. So when you have more CPUs, cumulatively you get more amount of memory. So what are the advantage we get? One is you can run the program faster, save time. And because you have more memory, you can solve larger problem. You can work on larger data. So how do we actually make use of HPC in a real life situation? Like let's say I talked about bioinformatics, drug designing. So that needs two set of people. One is the computational expert who know how to write parallel codes and you need a domain experts. They will tell what is the algorithm, how the molecules react, what is the chemistry behind them, so they are the domain experts and together with the computer science people put together we have a team which can develop an HPC application. So when you are designing an HPC application, first you have to think about the parallel algorithm. You have to think parallelly. We are used to thinking serially that has to change and we have to design a parallel algorithm. Once that is done, the domain experts tell how that algorithm is, then the computational expert will write the parallel code. How will they write the parallel code? I will give you an examples as to what are the frameworks that are available. And many a times um, one can use, there are some open source softwares that are available that can uh, help you in writing parallel codes. I gave you the stack, I showed you the stack where you had a framework, Intel Cluster Studio or there are debuggers, they all will help you in writing parallel codes. So now, how do you, uh, when you are writing a parallel algorithm, how do you make sure that uh, these, these codes, they run optimally? So one is that you have large number of processors and this large number of processors are to be used. It's like a factory has so many number of workers. And the manager's job is to make sure that all the workers are busy all the time. Then only the output of the factory will be optimal. So same thing is done here that each processor, you divide the work among the processor. The processor should do unique work, which is ideal situation. That means it is not dependent on anybody else. It is doing a unique work that is given to it. Then as a result, there is no communication between the processors that is at the minimal and the work is divided in such a way that all processors do equal work. But this is not actually possible in practice. The reason being some, the work division will not be equal because you cannot do that in many cases. There will always be some portion of your program that is going to be serial, some process, pro part of the program that can be made parallel. And as a result, 
they may not be able to do equal work. But this is ideal situation. We try to write the code in such a way that you approach the uh, this ideal situation. So there are some attributes that one sees in the parallel algorithms if you want to take advantage of the underlying parallel hardware. First is the concurrency. This is the basic principle that you need to have in your program. Suppose you have an algorithm that is inherently serial. There is nothing that can be done parallel in it. Then that program is not suitable for supercomputers. The algorithm that you have should have concurrency. That means it should have the ability to do certain large number of actions simultaneously. And what will you do? You will assign each of these tasks to one processor or one core and they will solve them concurrently. Next thing is scalability. So this is in scalability. You try to see if today you have 16 cores available, your program is running taking time t. Suppose you have 32 cores, will it take t by 2 time? If your algorithm is scalable, it will be able to make use of all the processors that are available. So that is the concept of scalability. Then the third concept is locality. We said that every processor has its memory. And if the data is in the memory of the same processor, then it is accessed faster. Otherwise, where does it go? It may go to main memory. It may go to the memory of the adjoining processor to get the data. If that happens, then that has to come through the system area network. And because of which writing these parallel programs, what is that uh, the philosophy that you follow? First is that uh, you distribute the data to the memory uh, on which the code is going to run. So you distribute the code to the memory of the processor. Then each program, each code on each processor runs independently. And sometimes they have to talk to each other. So that is called a synchronization of the workflow. That's where uh, the individual uh, processors, they will complete their task and wait for others to finish. And then there are some intelligent method by which, by efficient algorithm, you try to make sure that your program runs at the fastest possible speed. So there are some algorithms that are used. Uh, I've listed them here. Uh, a diagram will help us in understanding them. So what is a phase parallel algorithm? In phase parallel algorithm, this C is the compute part. So that is happening independently. There are multiple processors, C1 to Cn. Each one of them is doing the task assigned to it. And I said that the, they should be doing equal work, but that doesn't happen. Some finish faster. If one finishes faster, it will wait for others to finish. So that is called as synchronization. So there are two phases, compute and synchronize. So it's like uh, you are running a relay race. So one. Uh, uh, one uh, runner, he, in that case, they don't wait. They try to finish fast. But it is like there is what a, each one of them is, let, it, let, let us say these are belonging to same team. This is the point where they will exchange the baton. That means they will, this fellow has finished this task. He is handing over the baton to the next one. But here what happens is all of them wait for the slowest one to finish. So that is called as phase parallel. Other is called as divide and conquer. That is the process starts here. Half of the data is given to the one child, half of the data is given to other child, or half of the code is given to one child and half of the code is given to other child. What does the child do? It gives back to the grandchild, grandchild of this main parent. Like this, you can, as many processors you have, you keep dividing the work. And at one point in time, in the center of this, all of them would be busy. Then the children would return the process data to the parent. The parents would return the, uh, to the grandparent. Like this, you divide and conquer. That is other algorithm. Third one is called as pipelining. What do you do in pipelining? You divide the task in such a way that output of the previous stage becomes the input to the next stage. So typically, let's say you have a streaming data that is coming in. Video is coming in, and you want to analyze the video. Analysis can be done in three parts. First is, let's say, pre-processing. Some, some data is processed. A chunk is taken. Let's say one MB of data is taken. It is processed. And that one MB is given to Q. While Q is processing the second part of it, P can grab another one MB and process it. So what are we doing? Simultaneously, P, Q, and R are doing their assigned task. 
such that output of P goes to Q, output of Q goes to R and thus the task is completed. So all of them are acting in parallel but they are acting on the different portions of the algorithm that is pipelining. And the final one is called as process farm. As many workers you have, you keep adding them. The master will divide the work among the worker. Worker will return it back to the master. Process farm can be viewed upon a variation of the divide and conquer. In divide and conquer, the child gives it to the parent, whereas there is only one level of parent and child relationship here. The master gives it to the worker. As many workers you have, that much division of work will be done and it will be given to multiple workers. So these are some of the standard algorithms. You can have a mix and match of this. That depends upon what is the uh, logic that you want to implement, what is the kind of parallelism you have. So all that is a part of uh, the design of the algorithm or adoption of an algorithm for a given use case. So now, uh, how will you write a parallel program? What are the tools that are available to you? So there are few uh, well-known methods of writing parallel program. First framework is called as OpenMP. Okay. So OpenMP will work on a shared memory computer. So what is a shared memory computer? The one that I showed you here. This is a shared memory computer. These two processors are sharing the memory that is present here. All of them can, all the cores of these, all the two processors, they can equally access the memory. So this kind of computer is called as a shared memory computer and that uses a, a, a programming uh, framework called as OpenMP. So OpenMP can, you can run it, even OpenMP can run it on your laptop also because your laptop is definitely having more than one cores and this, how do you tell what portion is to be parallelized? You tell the compiler. I'm sure you, uh, you have heard about compiler directives like hash pragma and they are not the actual part of your code, but they tell the compiler what to do. So hash pragmas are uh, like uh, uh, compiler directives, so they can be used for programming using OpenMP. Other one is called as MPI, message passing interface. This is useful when you want to communicate between the nodes. We saw that uh, here we have a network which is connecting this, all these nodes. Now if this node wants to send data to other processor in the same box, then shared memory. But if you want to go from one node to other node, how will the data go? It will go through the switching fabric and the switching fabric will forward it to the next node. So that is called as MPI, message passing interface. So message passing interface makes use of distributed computing and uh, it is used, uh, this is very much scalable. You add many number of nodes, the data can be distributed, code can be distributed using MPI. Now we also heard about accelerators, NVIDIA accelerators. So they have come up with a uh, framework called as OpenACC. So open accelerating, accelerated computing is what it stands for. So this will work when you have accelerators. And again, it is compiler based directive. That is you tell which, which um, uh, GPU to use, how many cores to use, all that can be told through the directives and you can parallelize your code. So now I'll tell little bit about uh, how this is being implemented in the country. Okay? So what are we doing for that? And for that, we have a, a program, Government of India started a program in the year uh, 2016, which is called as a National Supercomputing Mission. So this is a program that is jointly being executed by uh, Department of Science and Technology and a Ministry of Electronics and IT. And this is being implemented by uh, IASC Bangalore and CDAC. So let us see what does this have, what are we trying to do through this. So as I mentioned, it's a joint initiative of METI and DST, which is being implemented by CDAC and ISC. Now there are four major deliverables of this mission. First is a creation of NSM facilities and infrastructure. I will show you some pictures that have been, um, the supercomputers that have been set up. So as of now, uh, 15 supercomputing facilities 
with 24 pita flops. Now you know what is a pita flop. Okay, so that is a total compute power of these systems is uh, about 24 pita flop. The nearest one from here is at uh, IIT Hyderabad. Uh, a system has been set up there. Then uh, in the coming days, nine more facilities with 40 pita flops is being planned. And the total cumulative power will be 64 pita flops. Uh, and that will be uh, till 2024, all these computing systems will be installed across India. Then these supercomputers, what will they use for? It is the applications that drive. And five applications of uh, national interest have been identified. So one is in the area of bioinformatics. So it is called as uh, used for genomics. So genomics, as you know, that every human being contains genes. And uh, uh, based on the way the genes express themselves, every human being has certain characteristics. Like certain persons are prone to diabetics. Their children are also prone to diabetic. We say that it's a genetic thing that they are carrying from their parents. There are many such things. So study of those genes and uh, making medicines that are suitable for a particular person, that is genomics. Drug discovery, you know, I gave you an example how the molecule docking is done, how it is found, uh, that whether that particular drug is effective against that disease or not. So that is the drug discovery. That is the bioinformatics is one vertical in which applications are being developed. Then flood forecasting and disaster management. So uh, you may be aware that typically in the uh, monsoon, the rivers get flooded and uh, there are dams. The dams also discharge data. There are localized uh, uh, rain. And when the rain falls in a given region, the natural slope of that terrain brings all the water to the river. So all this can be modeled and it can be forecasted that if there is so much of rain upstream, after so much time, this much volume of uh, water will come and based on the topography of that region, one can say that, okay, this much region around the river is going to be affected. The le water level is going to be five feet. So what can you do? What can the National Disaster Management Authority do? They can move people to safer spaces. You must have heard about uh, the cyclones being predicted and when they are going to hit, where they are going to hit, what is going to be their velocity. Based on that, the uh, National Disaster Management Agency, they move people away. So you can save lives by this. You may not be able to, you may not be able to protect the, uh, uh, the buildings and all from getting inundated because you can't move buildings, but at least you can move livestock, you can move people uh, through this uh, flood forecasting and there is a disaster can be managed in a much effective manner. I talked about uh, weather forecasting. So urban environment, this is very important that uh, how uh, you must have heard about uh, a, a cloud burst. They, when they happen in the cities, you have the water has to go to the storm water drainage, but that is not enough. You see, you saw what happened in Bangalore uh, this monsoon. The cars were floating in water and the posh areas where people stay, all of them were affected. Now there are various reasons for it like once upon a time Bangalore was a city of lakes and all of those were uh, encroached upon and the natural flow of water was stopped. So all this can be uh, modeled based on current topographic data and urban planning can be done in such a way that uh, you have least amount of flooding and such things that are due to uh, uh, excessive rains and other uh, weather condition. Uh, I mentioned about seismic data, that is you send waves below the crust of the earth, you read the reflected waves, and then that can be used for discovery of oil and gas. So this is being done with ONGC, and uh, we are developing, CDAC is developing this uh, algorithms and this uh, framework which they will use for effective uh, locating the wells. Where is the, they can then drill the wells at the appropriate location. Then discovering new materials and quantum chemistry, that is another field. Second one is uh, research and development uh, which can lead to exascale compu computing in the next mission. So CDAC has developed um, network uh, high-speed interf in interface card, Rudra's server motherboard, 
all of these are the components that are being used currently for the supercomputers and they will form the basis uh, improved versions of that will form the basis for exascale computing and when you are doing all this it's important that you do a human resource development training in HPC like this workshop this is sort of you can say an awareness some of you may get an idea about what supercomputing is maybe some of you may feel like they should do a career in supercomputing if that is the case uh, CDAC does offer all the help in making uh, systems available for training imparting training and uh, that is the mandate of human resource development now I will show some pictures the first supercomputer that was installed uh, under NSM was at IIT BHU that was inaugurated by Honorable Prime Minister then there is one at IIT Kharagpur so these are the 833 teraflop is its capacity that is 0.8 petaflop this is 1.66 double of that ISAR Pune then there is one at IIT Kanpur JNCSR Jawaharlal Nehru Center for Advanced Scientific Research that is in uh, Bangalore then I mentioned to you I, IIT Hyderabad that has Param Seva uh, that must be somewhere within the city then uh, this is uh, NABI is agricultural research organization that's at Mohali so they have one supercomputer CDAC Bangalore has got one and IAC has 3.3 uh, petaflop then uh, IIT Roorkee that also has got uh, 1.67 so these are the systems that have already been installed and as I mentioned these are used by used by the respective uh, institutes institutes near those institutes all of them get chance to use these systems and I was told that uh, there is uh, uh, there are some startups that are also going to come so I had put this slide this may not be useful to the students but CDAC has got a policy by which uh, MSMEs and startups they get uh, to use these supercomputers at a very affordable rates and some of them uh, can be supported by other government agency where the compute time can be uh, uh, given to them on this NSM facilities and I will also tell you about uh, something that is useful for as it for a training purpose which is called as a Param Shavak so Shavak is a cub of a uh, leopard so that's how this name is given and it is a supercomputing in a box solution if you look all these pictures you will see that these are data centers there is a false uh, flooring here through which uh, you can see these vents through which air conditioning is done there are these cables that go this all this is a controlled environment and setting up this data center itself takes crores of rupees then you add these supercomputers into this but not everybody can afford this kind of thing and suppose you want a lower end supercomputer which you can do without having all these facilities that is what Param Shavak is so it's a supercomputing in a box solution so what have we done we have taken a server class system and added a software stack onto it such that uh, you get fairly good amount of compute power but then this can be kept in your lab you don't need uh, cooling and other things for it and you can have one for HPC one is for deep learning that is AI techniques and one for virtual reality where you can use it for <coughs> imparting training uh, like how do you train a sailor about interiors of a submarine you can use virtual reality or you want to train a worker as to how to open a particular car that all can be shown through this so who can who are the potential users for this like somebody who doesn't know supercomputing but want to learn it in his lab so they these new users can use it there are some H, you already know about HPC but you don't uh, you have modest needs you don't need a big supercomputer you want but you want one for your own needs then you can have it or you are a developer so this uh, Param Shavak contains exactly the same software stack that you saw for the main computer so you have the hardware storage OS all the tools so the purpose is that you can use it in your lab develop the code but when you need performance you can come to the main computing systems okay so uh, I will have reached the almost end of my session uh, I will just have a summary uh, maybe you were not aware but today HPC is in use in our day-to-day -day life 
but most of the time it is uh, working silently, so we may not be aware of it. The basic principle in which HPC works is that it makes use of parallel computing that we saw how it makes use. And uh, it's not just the compute nodes that are there, but there are many components other than that. And uh, there, once you have these parallel uh, elements, you need to make use of it effectively. And that can be done through using the right algorithm. Once you have the algorithm, you have to write the code. And how will you write a parallel code? You have things like OpenMP, MPI, OpenACC, CUDA. These are the frameworks that are available. And in the last two, three slides, I told you that uh, uh, under this, what national supercomputing mission is, what are its objectives. And um, uh, they have a mechanism by which if there are startups and MSMEs, they can uh, medium and micro uh, organizations, small and medium micro organization enterprises, they can make use of it. And uh, I also gave you a brief idea about Param Shavak, which can be used as a training platform or a uh, platform for modest uh, uh, computing uh, uses. So this is a, a time. Uh, if you have any questions, I would be uh, ready to take them. He has one. Sir, sir, as you said, supercomputers are large in size. Can we have a supercomputer which is minimized to uh, which which can be carried easily, like a desktop, or we can expect such a model in future? So I gave you that example, Param Shavak. It's a it's a desk side. It doesn't need pulling. It doesn't make so others. If you visit a supercomputing facility, they need large amount of uh, cooling and all that. So that is all not required for this. So that is the smallest we can have. The uh, one that I showed you, it is, it is, uh, its architecture is no different than a, a server. It has got two CPUs. Each CPU has got uh, 16 cores, so total 32 cores you have got. So it has got all the hardware and software that a normal supercomputer has, but it is a, you can say, a, a, a stripped down version of it. So it cannot, I mean, for that matter, suppose you want to uh, develop OpenMP programs, that can be done even your laptop which has got Linux as an OS. So a uh, point being made is that you have various types of platforms available, some, but they will have limitation. Nothing can beat a full-fledged Super supercomputing com system. But what happens in a full-fledged supercomputing system is that multiple users can fire their jobs. They can run simultaneously, one after another. So that kind of facility you won't get, but it's you can say it's a personalized supercomputer in that sense, the Param Shavak. Okay. Uh, I have a question. Yeah. Uh, the, this is, uh, we already have a Google Collab, uh -huh. which is extending uh, this kind of supercomputing capabilities to others. Does CDAC have any, have any plans for that, similar plans for that? So currently all the systems that we have, see what happens is that uh, making a, making a facility available on a cloud is has its own uh, advantages the basic thing being that uh, you can uh, now this is this must be free for you but in general uh, cloud the idea behind having a cloud system is that uh, you don't uh, you don't invest in any of this hardware or software somebody else does it you are only paying as you use and if your usage increases you pay more if your usage decreases you pay less that is the idea of having a cloud. So technically, AWS also has got, or I don't know about Google, but AWS uh, has got uh, 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 HPC available. You can, you can do that. But what happens is that uh, uh, we are following even a better model wherein you can actually use, I mean, see, cloud adds a layer. And the advantage of cloud is that you can shrink or expand, as I said, but here, you can submit a job saying that currently my current job needs, let's say, eight processors. You can submit another job which uh, simultaneous, which needs eight processors, 16 processor, whatever. So it, it is even better than uh, that cloud because you uh, directly get a login onto it. So it's like using a computer with you, I mean. And it is remote. You just need uh, only the data is an issue. If you are having large amount of data to be processed, then you have to see how you can move it there because over network it is very slow. People send it through hard disk also. We get data on hard disk, one TB hard disk. We get it, we connect it and 
then uh, copy the data onto the file system that I showed. So, okay, how is that uh, the revenue model for uh, cloud? Because you know, uh, the Google's collab, for instance, it's very interesting because we fire uh, programs onto it all over, all over the world and it requires huge amount of uh, uh, power to you know, sustain it. So how is it that they are sustaining it and what is this model? Are they, are there any, what are they doing with you know, the input that we are feeding to that uh, class? Uh, you know, the now see, finally, at the end of the day, every computing systems will follow the same basic von Neumann architecture model that CPU, program, memory, data, and I.O. This is all it is exactly same, whether it is Google Colab or AWS or CDAC supercomputers, they finally the core is the same thing. Now, in this case, I mean, uh, that you are asking how they are doing it, see, that is what, there is a layer that is hiding that from all of us, how they are doing. I mean, for that matter, they say, how is that anybody can upload any amount of videos on YouTube, but still everybody gets space? That is what they are doing. As they say that, how, I mean, at any given point in time, half of the data that is generated in the world is in the last two years or last three years. So that is a kind of explosion, ex explosion that is happening. So they are, uh, uh, they are giving you a service and, and based on their prediction, based on their uh, estimation, they are adding this. And I mean, I mean, it, uh, I mean, it's really a wonder you may say that uh, when COVID happened, before that nobody was going online. Everybody was uh, doing learning, everything was, most 99% of it was physical. There may be some Khan Academy on these kind of things where students were on NPTEL, that's where they were learning. But at just, just COVID stuck within a month or two, everybody was doing online through Zoom, through, uh, where did this, all this bandwidth come from? So many streams going and somehow it managed. I mean, I mean, I can't answer it, nobody can answer it, but it somehow happened, the industry rose to the occasion. Of course, internet connectivity in rural areas was not good in India and all, but that is fine, we lived with it. But, I mean, maybe the same answer is there. When there is a need and they see that it's happening, they keep on adding that. that that's, that's possibly I can say. Uh, like, is there a plan similar to Google Colab, I think, right? If, uh, say, we want to use it, like, like say, you know, probably with lots of students, hmm. accessing, uh, uh, like, say, multi-processing related capabilities, so or... They might be improving their architecture, you know, based on our uh, No, see, uh, the, as I said, the basic architecture is always going to remain, I mean, as I foresee, uh, cluster plus accelerator, and what can happen is like now processors are coming with uh, more number of cores. Processors are coming with uh, more memory that they can support. So you are able to address bigger problems. We will have uh, uh, like if let's say the average number of processors in the supercomputers in India early were 50,000, they may easily become one lakh or they may become two lakh. So that increase is going to happen because uh, <coughs> what happens is as I was mentioning, uh, that graph that I showed, uh, the basic elements are getting uh, more powerful. Like you have today A100 CUDA has got 5,000, 7,000 plus cores. The first CUDA architecture that came were hardly few hundreds. So that's happening. Uh, the Hopper and other processors that they are bringing, AMD has got instinct. So the uh, basic, whatever basic impro improvements happens in the basic compute element, that gets multiplied, multifold when you have it on a supercomputer. So that way it's going to happen and to answer uh, Prof's question, uh, the aim of super, uh, national supercomputing mission is to democratize HPC in the country. Like you have a requirement, uh, I mean we will have to approach, say what is that and it will be, see it's like this, that uh, as I was mentioning, currently we have 15 systems with 20 petaflops. We are going to have uh, more systems with another uh, 40 petaflops that's going to come in next. So that is also what's happening is it's also increasing exponentially. And whatever is available, it is to be used based on the needs that collective needs that we have. So the model that currently that is being followed in NSM is that, uh, let's say there is a computing system at uh, IIT Hyderabad because they are hosting it, they get 60% of the compute time. 
So remaining 40% of all such cumulative systems that we have, that is for anybody and everybody in the country. Only thing is the genuineness of the requirement has to, there will be a mechanism to gauge that. So that uh, nobody hogs it just for that. Maybe the head of the institute endorses it or some mechanism, bare minimum mechanism uh, we will, there is going to be. We used to have something known as the National Knowledge Network. Yeah. Which uh, was also this high performance. Uh, so network. these, all these supercomputers are connected to NKN. So any, any institute that has got an NKN connectivity can get access to any of these supercomputers. How about the Tier 2, Tier 3 institutions? Correct. So the way it, uh, I mean, I didn't show, get into details of NSM, but uh, there is the way uh, they are doing it is a hub and spoke model. Let us say, suppose uh, uh, you're talking about, uh, let's say in Telangana. At the moment, the only facility that is available here is typically IIT Hyderabad. There is going to, there is, I mean, you go a little bit south, there is one at uh, IIT, I mean, NIT Trichy. You go a little bit uh, south, uh, uh, southeast, there is the big facility as at ISC Bangalore. So like this, uh, these in and around that area, they will be, I mean, that is that 40% is for them. Remaining 40% is within the geographical region. That's how it's supposed to be. Uh, in the last uh, 10 years or so, I think last 10 or 15 years, China suddenly overtook USA as the number one, and it was a huge explosion in numbers, not a trivial one. So what is the model that they are following? What are the applications? How is their supercomputing mission different from ours? How do they popularize and become so fast? So uh, what China does in any, any, any field is brute force, okay? And they, they go hook or crook, whether it is railways. Once upon a time, they had less number of uh, length of railways uh, than India, once upon a time. And uh, their speeds were minimal. Now they have got the biggest uh, high-speed railway network in the world. They have connect, I mean, for political reasons or whatever, they connected Tibet. I mean, the workers were not getting enough oxygen to work there. They have worked in that kind of environment. The, car, the, uh, the trains are all like aircraft. They are fed with oxygen and all because it's going to the roof of the world. We call Tibet as the roof of the world. So anything that China does, whether it is manufacturing, whether it is, I am told that 80% of big furnitures in India comes from China. I'm not, I mean, not this, I mean the whole home furniture and all. Everybody goes and because their scale of volume is, uh, I think 100 times than anybody in the world. I mean to give an example, India had, uh, after this, uh, 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 we had this issue at uh, Leh, I mean that Ladakh part, the uh, government of India brought a scheme by which you cannot import anything where India shares a land border. That was, we know what it was for. So now, today, uh, none of the mouse and keyboards in the world are made anywhere except China. They say that what I can make in US for 10 rupees they gave it me for less than one rupee. I mean, who will who will not go? You know that Apple, 90% of Apple computers are made in China because they are such a, I mean, that's what I call it as brute force. So they apply it to anything, whether it is manufacturing, railways, computing. And it was said that uh, they got a lot of uh, Chinese who were working in US. They got them with by paying double, three times salary, they got it there. Along with them, they got what they were working on, and they have their own processor. Once upon a time, Chinese supercomputer was top in the world. That's where US government uh, made it a prestige issue, and now the number one is there. By the way, it is a rumor that we, we, I showed you the exaflop uh, system, the first exaflop system at uh, Oak Ridge Frontier. But it is said that uh, before that, uh, Chinese already had an exascale computer, but they didn't tell the world. Today, even today they don't say their computer is at number five, the top one, Tinahe 2. That is at number five. It was at number one, as I said, it keeps falling, new, new comes in, so they weed out the, the ones that are less powerful. So uh, they, uh, uh, they had that, but they, they, have, they, they made the exascale before US, but they did not submit the result. It is rumored, I mean, I mean even the, 
the list is made by a professor called Jack Dongra in US. Uh, he got the Alan Turing Award by ACM this year. So in the supercomputing 22, which happened from uh, uh, 13th to 18th of November, just last week, he gave the keynote talk in which he also mentioned this, that possibly they have it, but they have not submitted, so we, we, we cannot officially say that they have it. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I had a question with respect to the difference between any cluster computing system or uh, HPC high performance computing. So uh, obviously there is a compu computational speed kind of difference, but can you go into the specifics of like how do you differentiate between the two? Between like, HPC and? Uh, no, any cluster computing system like cloud computing, uh, like uh, Sir mentioned Colab or anything, right? Or any. Uh, like distributed computing system which is there in a college. Right. So uh, one, uh, if you take a, a distributed computing system, uh, take, let's say an, uh, take an example, uh, let's say you have uh, uh, 20 computers in your lab, connect you using modest uh, ethernet like you have here, 1 GB ethernet, that's the minimum you get these days. So uh, that also fits into the definition of supercomputer because you have parallel computing elements and they have a mechanism to talk to each other. That is what is basically needed. But uh, there was there is a program you can search for. I mean, it's now uh, quite old, Bewolf, B-W-O-L-F, Bewolf cluster. So what, what it aims is that you don't use any specialized thing. You use whatever is available with you and uh, make a cluster out of it and it will run. For that matter, uh, people have also made uh, uh, this same parallel computing infrastructure using Raspberry Pi. I'm sure all of here know what Raspberry Pi is. So it has got an uh, Ethernet port. It has got a uh, four-core CPU. So yeah, I mean, even in CDAC, we tried that. And this HPL uh, benchmark that I said, which is used for top end, that also runs on it. For that matter, you can try this. HPL benchmark is available even for Android. And you can check what is the uh, Linpack equivalent of your uh, mobile, I mean your mobile phone has. You will find that it is more than what the first param uh, that CDAC made in 1988. So it, it can be proved. I mean, point is that it is also distributed computing is a, is a you can say, a subset of it, OK? But supercomputing is purpose designed. So what will we do? We will have the network which is much faster. Uh, this network is, uh, Ethernet is meant to scale uh, millions of nodes. I mean, uh, you can say all the computers in the world are connected using Ethernet and you have the uh, uh, long distance links, telecom links which are connecting to that. But every, you have a mechanism by which every computer has got a unique address and they are communicating with each other. You have servers anywhere in the world, but using browser you can reach them. So this is the basic underlining is Ethernet, Ethernet's, uh, uh, the word Ethernet, how did it come? Because uh, uh, Robert McCaff, who made, conceived Ethernet, he felt that, uh, I'm sure many of you know that where Earth's, um, uh, Earth's atmosphere ends, an ether starts. Like initially, how did light come to, how, uh, now we say that light has dual nature, but earlier light was assumed to be a wave only wave. Now then, after that we had photon theory to explain high frequency and low frequency. Today in Re Halliday Resnick, many of you would have re re remember reading, light has dual nature. So light is a wave. And how does wave travel from sun to earth without any medium? So they assumed ether, luminiferous ether. And that's how Robert Melkaff said that I will call it ethernet because someday it will reach moon. It will reach everywhere in the universe. So that is the basic purpose of Ethernet, that it should spread across scalability and distance at the cost of speed. What does uh, InfiniBand Paramnet do? They sacrifice distance, but they uh, gain on the latency and bandwidth. So that is a difference, right? So you can use a normal truck uh, to uh, carry um, sand or um, earth, but if you are excavating something, you need a dumper. You need, a, if you are using it in a mine, you need even a bigger dumper because the amount of uh, uh, ma amount of the ore you want to move is much larger than the sand that you need for building your house. So the concept is same. Engine is, 
internal combustion engine uses diesel everything is same but the scale is more here it's 10 hp there it is 100 hp or 1000 hp so that is the difference uh, like you can say that it's kind of relative term no it is a specialized kind of hardware software and network stack put together for fast transfer of data from memory of one node to another that is how uh, one can say that you have a program you de you have a pro problem to solve you divide that problem into smaller ones assign one problem to each of these processor which has got high memory and it can parallelly talk all of them can parallelly talk to the uh, storage and all these attributes you add to see that see it is all about removing the bottleneck you have to transfer data i don't have it my neighbor has it how can i get it fast so you have a designer high bandwidth low latency network i all of them want to write data to the uh, file system uh, together how can i make a mechanism for parallel file system so it is all about uh, purpose designing something to uh, suit a particular way of solving the problem that's how i will put it he has a question here to your left yeah. <coughs> yeah. Good afternoon, sir. I am Ababu from Kite Group of Institutions. Yeah. So, so our desktop RAM and uh, mobile RAM is same because is same or not? Because consider a situation like uh, our laptop and uh, mobile have same number of cores and the same amount of RAM, but they are not working with same efficiency. Why? Right? So there, are, there is a difference between the way the architecture of a laptop and an architecture of a mobile phone is conceived. Okay? So first thing is that uh, uh, we, we, uh, we, can, uh, uh, we can look at the purpose for which they are designed. Okay? Uh, both of them you can say are, are like a personal devices. The main purpose of phone is uh, to allow communication, uh, making a call is what the basic thing is. But by making it smart, we have put an operating system that is Android. Okay? And that Android is again tailored for a certain kind, of, uh, certain kind of architecture. Now what is the main thing that you have in a mobile phone that is different from laptop is uh, the battery part. Right? You want that when you charge it in the morning, it should last till you whole day it should last. That is your basic expectation from it. Okay? Laptop is not like that. Most of the time you will connect through power or sometimes you will not, it will, you will get power within, um, whenever it discharges, you will have the ability to charge it. So here the concentration on a laptop. Laptop you can say is a miniaturized version of a desktop. Okay, desktop is as much powerful as you can get the uh, uh, maximum amount of memory, maximum amount of uh, speed, the, the frequency, all that you can tailor and you get a good workhorse in a desktop. What is laptop? Laptop is a miniaturized version of it. Anything that runs on desktop is going to run on laptop. Only thing is that it is slightly uh, uh, aware of that it is running on battery. So you'll find that the screen goes blank. You will find that if nothing is working, the frequency of the processor is scaled down. If you run a faster program, it will start the fan running fast because the frequency of the CPU will go up. So point I'm trying to make is in case of phone, the limitation comes from the battery or what frequency you can run the processor at will be limited by the battery that you have. So it will not be very high performing for sure. So within that, so any application that you write, anything that you write that runs on the mobile phone, will be aware of the limited compute power that it has. Whereas in desktop that is or a laptop that is not really a case, though laptop will definitely have awareness about the battery because it's actually a, a desktop that has been brought into a form factor such that you can carry it. You can just like you can carry a phone in your pocket, this you say that you can carry it in a bag with you. So s uh, size, weight, running on battery, these are its prime design criteria. Whereas in case of mobile phone, the low frequency of CPU and uh, low drain of battery is what the main design criteria is. 
and it is it is a purely a personal device desktop you can create more users you can run things in background if you press control or delete you will find something like 50 60 processes are running because the operating system is more powerful there it is again a linux android is nothing base is linux but it is tuned for running less number of applications but each one of them giving good uh, user experience so many a times you find that the applications are so designed that they will depend on some uh, server for uh, data and other things this is just a user access device that is how it is looked upon so if you have heard about this client server computing then that is the model that the phone is supposed to follow it's a user interface it will have limited amount of compute capability thank you sir Sir, yes. this is Vamsi from Kite. Yeah. How HPC performance measures, sir? Huh. Yeah, sir. Right. So, see, there is uh, there are two ways of measuring it. One is called as the theoretical peak. So, if you go to the top 500, you visit that website yes, and see the list. Okay. Let's say you look at uh, rank number one to hundred. There will be two columns. One is called as R peak. So, peak is something. <coughs> There is a theoretical peak and there is a measured peak. Measured peak. What is theoretical peak? Assume that the CPU is running at 1 gigahertz. That is 1 into 10 to the 9 uh, clock cycles in a second. Okay, and assume that it can do one floating point operation in one cycle. So it will be 1 into 10 raised to 9 floating point operation that it can do theoretically. Okay, but you run that HPL benchmark, the one I mentioned, high performance link pack HPL. Then it will simulate real life condition, partial differential equations or uh, 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 structural mechanics equations. It will run. And then it will see while it run the program, how many floating point operation could it actually do. So okay, instead of 1 into 10 to the power 9, it could be 0.5 into 10 to the power 9 only. So that is the actual performance. So the least is made. So when we say that it is 1 exaflop, it is actually theoretical peak is 1.5 exaflop. Yes. But when the program was done, it found to be 1.1. Okay. Thank you, sir. Yes.